Hi guys, Mike here. Welcome back to another video on the channel. Just making my way to a trail that takes me to a nice camp location and uh, should be quite interesting. The last time we went out we tested the Discoverer Cooper ST Max PORs with the studs and um, we tackled some, some fairly deep snow around 60 centimetres but then those conditions were ideal because it was very cold about minus 10 minus 15 so the snow is like powder today we're looking at temperatures just above zero degrees C the snow is starting to kind of get very very heavy and uh, I think we're going to be in for some fairly tough wheeling conditions to get to this camp spot like some pretty deep snow to start off with but uh, maybe maybe it gets a little bit better so I've parked up at the edge of the trail you can see how deep the snow is it's really just up to my my waist as it goes in well just just below and um, you know and, and then it sort of teeters out to around about 80 centimeters so I think this is going to be very challenging this first bit anyway but, I mean I can always shovel it away a little bit see how I get on There's a chance in hell of me getting through this trail. In. Not a lot really. Only just here. I mean, this is about zero degrees C now, so the problem we've got is uh, yeah, this is really heavy snow, and uh, ideally, you want to be on top of it. Just going to put the chains on, and I know what you're thinking, why don't you lie them on the ground and blah blah blah, but this is the way I put the chains on because they're very tight on these tyres. And, um, you know, when you lie them on the ground, you just can't put them on very easily. Ah. 
made these tensioners out of uh, trampoline springs. You put one every other link. And uh, they're pretty good actually. Keep chains tight. Put the chains on the rear axle and they're pretty tight um i don't think it's going to make any difference to be honest in this kind of kind of snow um maybe if you had chains on the front as well uh that might help a little bit but the problem then you've got is you just dig um i'm putting the chains on the back uh, as a test really and not on the front because you know my experience with driving in these conditions the front tends to float a bit more the back tends to already have the 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 snow dug out from underneath it from the vehicle passing over and then you benefit from a little bit of traction kind of pushing you along like this almost you're surfing it does kind of work but again these conditions are really tough yeah we'll give it a go but i'm doubtful Well, in all honesty, I think this is a total fail of a mission, which is a real shame. Once you've made a track, it's not so bad, but the work involved just to get a short distance and keep hitting the snow, flattening it out, reversing back, hitting it again, reversing back, you know, following that same line. It's a lot of stress actually on the vehicle and uh, the engine's not overheating. Temps are just around 85 all the time. I mean, it's a diesel. It seems to enjoy this kind of work, but uh, it's going really really fast it doesn't like but um yeah i'm, I'm gonna bail i'm gonna bail find somewhere take the chains off and maybe try and find somewhere else i can camp that doesn't involve a 10 kilometer track that uh, i'm 50 meters into lucky to be able to find this track at this time of year most places in a vehicle like mine are basically undrivable unless you're on monster tires um, you know and really really low pressures and it's really how how far you want to go um, you know that last track we were on I could have kept hitting it and hitting it and hitting it but I would have been there for for ages I would have been there all day all night and uh, you know it causes a lot of stress on the vehicle you can potentially break something when you're on your own you've got to kind of learn to um, just kind of either give up or uh, call it a day you know and that's what I'd rather do and I'm pretty lucky to have found this
Well, that was a really, really nice drive. Nice track, actually. I've not driven that one before. Driven part of it to the reserve, but uh, never come up here before. Not much of a view. It was a bit further back, but I don't want to block the track in case someone comes. I'm just going to be here, and if a plow truck does arrive, or anyone else, then um, yeah, there's plenty of room to not scoop me off the track and have any trouble, and I can always get out of the way then. But a uh, bit of an unfortunate incident on the way up. These, uh, these grouse, they burrow under the snow, and uh, obviously to keep warm. And they were on the track, and uh, as I was driving along, they started popping up as they do, and, and obviously this one got got run over but i'm not going to let it go to waste i'm actually going to have this for um have this for dinner so i'll get this prepared and get the breast cut out and uh, fry that up and and have that for dinner so uh, it's been, been a few years since i've been doing any hunting i used to do a lot of hunting back in the uk but hasn't have yet done my exam here and got my uh, got my guns over from from the uk to sweden so it has to wait a bit but gonna do that this year because uh coming out like this and just being on your own there's something magical about it and uh, it's really quiet here and we're pretty high up as well which is nice so bit better. Not amazing though, but it'll do. You might sort of ask why I'm clearing the ground because the snow is insulation. A bit of reindeer crap there. Um, but uh, yeah, snow is insulation. If I was in my bivvy setup, I'd absolutely leave the snow there. But um, you know, I like, I like a bit of a flat surface, and my sleep mat is rated to minus 30. So I'm not really bothered about uh, you know the ground being cold. Much much prefer a flat surface. But anyway, get the awning out. One thing I will say, I'm absolutely sweating. It's not good. It's probably all the digging. But if it was really, really cold temperatures, that would be really bad. But given we're plus three and everything's melting, I'm not really too bothered. One thing to bear in mind about awnings in snow, they get broken. Um, we've got heavy snow forecasted. And, uh, you know, as much as this is an ARB awning, a lot of plastic parts, a lot of sort of thin aluminium and rivets and stuff like that. They're not that strong. Um, so uh, you, you've got to kind of bear in mind that you might have to run it like that so the snow can come off. But we'll come to that bridge when we cross it. For the time being, I'll just get it level. Then we'll put the awning room out.
Normally all this bulky gear is on the roof rack. If I was traveling with Megan and Max, my wife and son, um, this is the stuff that takes up a lot of space. All the mattresses, the bedding, the sleeping bag, the pillows, the clothes. Now we don't run a rooftop tent. We just run the awning room for the time being. We're testing that out. All this kind of bulky stuff, and it's not very heavy, goes on top of the rack. So if the rack looks disused, it's just because I ain't got Megan Max with me, so there's no point loading it up there, especially with this weather. So I don't really have the storage in the dry bags yet to be able to do it properly, so because we're transitioning over. But, um, the awning room's just in here. This is an ARB awning room, 250 by 250. Uh, what I will say is the build quality is okay, but I've had to make a lot of mods to it, which I'll show you, and uh, some repairs and stuff, and not recommended for high winds. The main repair I had to do was just here. You can see we've stitched all of that and we've added additional fabric. It tore as soon as we slid it in about on the ninth time and that was because the aluminium on the awning room hadn't been filed down and sanded you know it's just they just cut it straight off put a plastic cap on it and they think that's going to be all right but it ripped straight away and uh yeah you know when you spent the best part of 600 quid on an awning and an awning room and it tears the ninth time you've been out it's not so good so when you do buy an awning just take the plastic cap off the end and file away with a bit of sandpaper and you won't have that problem you won't have to do this repair things I've added, just some additional guy lines, just stitch those into the seam there. You can just kind of tie these on to certain places. When the wind blows, a little bit of a better chance holding things taut, but we've got to get this all pegged down as well. Need to save as much battery as we can for the heater for tonight when it drops below zero. It's going to be minus seven tonight, so uh, need to kind of think about that. Twelve and a half volts on the battery. It's pretty good. Uh, Not expecting any wind, but always good practice to have some pegs in. Can never really get them all the way in in these conditions. Need to buy some new ones with big spikes on made of steel for the winter. But uh, it's in halfway, like most of them. And uh, you can always pack a bit of snow down and kind of do your best to anchor them in. One thing to consider about this ARB awning room if you do buy it is uh, this bottom bit here will remain open. There's no zip, no Velcro. So they have a zip at the at the side there, but they don't put anything here. I've added Velcro uh, specifically for winter camping and for the wind because it's just flapping around all the time. And if you sleep in it, you'll have a bit of trouble. So same with the door, uh, but that just really makes a huge difference to the heat retention and it is waterproof it is windproof and it's not really breathable so it tends to hold the heat pretty good
This is the diesel heater unit. We made a few videos back and it just comes around here with a duct and plumbs straight into the top of the awning room there. Um, and hopefully we'll fire that up later and it will uh, help take the chill off the night. Got a little electronics box here. Uh, this is like wires and even some jump leads and stuff like that. Stuff for the air compressor, charging laptops, whatever. Um, got this thing here, it's like a inflator thing. Sometimes you use it for the boat, but mainly I, I use a compressor if uh, I'm gonna take the little boat out for, for Max. But I've got an auxiliary line that just runs off of the leisure battery, as well as these plugs and things. And that just goes into the diesel heater, but it also, runs kind of this sort of stuff to to plug into the air mattress and pump that up just wanted to give you a little show of the awning room kind of it's quite spacious i mean two and a half meters by two and a half meters with obviously two and a half meter awning and uh, you know it's a nice space for a family but I've got all my bedding here I won't put that on the ground till later got my sleeping bag got some pillows I've just got like my clothing wash kit you know things like that hygiene and stuff I always carry that bag and I normally only carry five pairs of underwear five pairs of socks five shirts you know just kind of rotate and, and you know a couple of pairs of outdoor trousers and things like that when I travel and I wash in rivers and things like that streams and lakes and you know, in the summer it's obviously much easier to do that, in the winter it's really difficult because you know the temperatures are really low. I've also got a folding table there with a with a basin that I've just kind of popped in and, and glued on. You can fold that flat or pop that out. We won't really be using that in here, be using the snow outside to wash all the gear. And a little camp kitchen alu box there from Wingfields, a rotor pack for water, another rotor pack. I've carried only one full of water uh, just because there's so much snow around. I can just go out and scoop some up, pack it down keep going and have some water ready in no time so the only thing missing is is what I wanted for the floor I ordered it two weeks ago and it never arrived um, it hasn't arrived yet I should say and that was some foam tiles that could click into the floor and uh, basically uh, give you a nice bit of insulation on the ground and uh, that'd be great for the baby so when he's crawling around in here um, he's sitting on the floor and stuff he's not getting cold because really the floor is, is kind of the main issue here um, but uh, yeah it's a nice space and it uh, should, should be a comfortable night. Why did it do that? What a shame, eh? Just went to start my stove up and uh, it's taken some damage here from heat which I was very mindful of right from the very beginning, but now the hose is gone and, and gas is leaking from here. So I'm without a stove. Good job I carry a toolkit with me. Um, managed to repair it, just cutting it a lot shorter and I've managed to put that on there. Could have brought some cable ties with me. I don't know why I don't have any. I've obviously forgot to put them in the Jeep, but just a cable tie around there would be nice. But it's got a fairly long nipple on it and it's on pretty tight so as long as this stays elevated like that on there we've got a stove I really hope this works if it doesn't grab it and throw it out the jeep as fast as possible Seems to be okay there, I mean there's not really any heat there. It's 
that's fine, I can keep my finger there all day, so. Looking good, Jimmy. Always a brisk experience on the snowshoes. Hard work in this snow though. Easier to be on a set of skis or something, but uh, finding firewood in these conditions is always quite challenging. You really want to look for dead standing trees. I was going to have a fire tonight and I was just looking around for a, a dead standing tree. You don't really have much of a variety up here in the north. Um, you know, you've got Picea ABs, the spruce, call it the Norwegian spruce in the UK, this one here, your Pinus sylvestris, which is basically what we call Scots pine in the UK, in the birch, Betula pendula, and you've got uh, like goat willow as well, and sometimes alder in some of the nature reserves, but really the only kind of dead standing you often find are the spruce or the pine, normally the spruce actually, and um, around here anyway and then uh, you know you can take a tree and, and make a fire but actually it's not technically legal just to come out and cut a tree down um, if it's already on the ground it's fine and uh, there's a law in Sweden all man's right and that's the right to roam the right to camp and the right to pick berries and mushrooms and things like that and also hunt as well um, in a respect and fish, you know, provided you've got the permission or permits and stuff. And, um, you know, whether it's private land or not, but obviously just driving a car around and going off road is, is not something you can do, but there's lots of tracks and forest roads and things you can spend your time on like I do. And they're perfectly adequate, really. But, um, hoping there was a lake there. Looks like a mirror, which is basically like a bog. I think I'm going to put the diesel heater on. And just put it on low, see if I can bring the temps up a bit. And uh, it'll be a bit warmer for later on. And see how it runs. See what sort of power drain we run as well. I'm pretty doubtful that we can keep this running on all night, even with this huge leisure battery I've got. But it uh, be interesting to try it out, that's why we're here. There we go. It's relatively weather resistant this, um, considering how I've built it. It would be more clever to have that underneath, obviously. Um, but the way the insulation is on the floor and, and the exhaust and everything, I had to have a plate in there. Um, but this is just the outlet and it is pretty loud. I mean, you could build this silencer into the inside of the unit and there's quite a lot of space to be able to do that still, but I don't really trust these. This has already begun to experience signs of leakage and collapsation on the inside. So I'd rather it be on the outside for the time being. And it also means I can direct the, the gas away from here you know, so to limit the risks of carbon monoxide poisoning. But you do have to, you really should have a carbon monoxide detector. Another question might be, why do I draw fresh air from the outside, which is obviously gonna be a lot colder, and pump that into the inside rather than have the unit on the inside of the awning and just have the exhaust coming out through like a insulated flue of sorts, a bit like a wood burning stove or like a silicon kind of flange, you know, that you can stitch into the material. Um, or you can even have a duct going all the way back round into another part of the awning room, so you're just recirculating the air 
inside the awning room. The reason I don't do that is condensation and, and moisture buildup. When you recirculate the air with these diesel heaters, you tend to get much damper air. I mean, I, I can't explain the science behind it, but somebody in the comment section probably will. Whether you're in a garage or you're in a tent, if you draw in fresh air from the outside and you pump it in, yeah, it's not as efficient in terms of heat. Um, it does take longer for the unit to heat up the room or the space, but the air is incredibly dry and you don't get any moisture in there at all. And, um, and that's a massive benefit in, these kind of in this kind of climate. Oh, look at that crop, full, full. See what he's been eating. Oh, look at all those catkins in there. All the catkins and buds, all sorts of stuff really. I think the trauma on this bird's pretty heavy. Oh, look at it, it's mash up. That is a shame. Oh, it's not too bad actually. Well, I used to do the pigeons back in the UK. They normally break the wings first, but kind of just wanted to check it out, see what it was like. Good job there's a lot of snow around there, but those breasts look pretty decent, pretty intact. So uh, yeah, a few broken bones, always got to watch out for that. They'll go straight through you. And uh, yeah, it's nice. Crop is flipping full though, get rid of all of that. And uh, break those wings. Looks like a bit of a mess, but it's just feathers. And yeah, they always get stuck to everything. There you go. So, I mean, you know, it took a hit when we run it over. But uh, the actual breasts, all you do now is you clean all this rubbish up and uh, get rid of all the feathers and stuff. You just literally have to peel them off with your hands and it's double breasted. So you can then take that bit away as well. But um, that looks pretty good. I think we're going to get that cooked up for dinner. Get it washed up first. See how it goes. Oh, it's been a great day. Really nice bit of driving. Really nice track and a nice, nice bit of exploration. Um, some tough conditions nearer to where I live, where the snow is actually a lot heavier than it is up here. Um, despite us being higher at this point in time, I think we're about 600 metres above sea level now, as it says on the GPS. And uh, yeah, we might even see the northern lights tonight. They're pretty active at the moment, the Aurora Borealis, but I've got a feeling with this cloud cover, we're not going to have much luck, but it's a prime spot to be able to see it, especially if you walk that way through the forest and there's a big hill and up on the nature reserve there it is beautiful up there all the old spruces and the old pines the trees are totally different in that nature reserve i love it in there but uh yeah night is drawing in gonna wind in make some dinner and enjoy the warmth of the awning room because it is starting to drop below zero again and they do say minus seven this evening so uh, that'll be interesting to see how the diesel heat performs
Right, it's a beautiful morning. Sun hasn't quite hit camp yet. When I woke up this morning, the Jeep looked like, uh, looked like a block of ice. We had some rain in the night. Ice rain, obviously. I was very warm in the awning room. I dropped the heater down to about 1.4 hertz, which is the lowest setting. I did that to conserve power and fuel um, for the points where I wasn't really needing the warmth because I was in my sleeping bag and you know, I was tucked up in bed. Um, so I managed to conserve quite a lot of fuel. The battery's still only just below 12 volts, so like 11.9 which is great. And I've cranked the heater up now to about 4.5 hertz. And you really kind of need that with the awning room. The thing I've found is if you're running it anywhere below about 4 hertz, um, it just isn't pumping in enough air to, uh, to fight with, with the loss of heat. And it always remains cold on the floor level. But when you crank it up to 4.5, it really forces the air in. It balloons the awning room out. And, uh, and you feel the heat low down. So uh, it's something I've got to think about and I'm going to extend the range of the fuel tank on that. But the sound of the diesel heater actually helped me go to sleep. It's like a bit of white noise and when it's running on low power, it's not too loud. It just cancelled out a lot of the, the noise around me of all this stuff dropping off the trees, all the snow coming down. And uh, yeah, I slept like a baby or not because actually my baby doesn't sleep that great. So I slept really well. <laughs> Well, this is the inside of the pad. You can see it's pretty, pretty comfortable in here. I've got it fairly organised how I'd like it to be. And um, yeah, there's also plenty of space as well. One thing I will say is it's totally dry in here. Obviously there's drops of, of moisture on the floor and stuff. You know, there's not really a lot you can do about that because you're walking in and out all the time. But the walls are totally dry. There's no condensation. There's no condensation on the bag or anywhere else. Um, my clothes are completely dry, my trousers got completely dried out overnight, they were really wet at the bottom and uh, yeah that, that was, that's obviously a huge plus and just pumping in that warm fresh air is, is really, um, it is t-shirt weather in here really, you can kind of feel the temperature difference when you get to, when you get to there where my head is, you know it starts to get really really hot and down here it's cooling off a bit and I think we've got a bit of a bit of a draft coming in through, through the door that was the one place I didn't put velcro because I ran out so I, I might get some more and put that there but uh, we do have a vent in the top left there and uh, you know I've opened that periodically whilst I've been cooking in here to let the moisture out and that really helps with the diesel heater to get get the moisture out of here so you don't get any build up but it's dried the place out really well and um, I think that's the nice part nice to put on dry clothes in the morning and um, you know, have a dry bag and, and not have to kind of like contend with condensation. diesel heat is still running but it's actually just going into the back of the hatch now and sort of putting some hot air in the vehicle but uh, I did this aluminium window swap uh, probably a couple of years ago now where we basically just took the window out made an aluminium panel the same shape wrapped aligned it put a rotor pack mount on it and um, you know the saw and the axe and stuff are bolted the other side but what I'm going to put just here is you get these lockable receivers you can buy that you use to fill water into caravans and stuff and they you know you can get some pretty big ones so they don't restrict the airflow I'm gonna get one of those put in there and it's got about a 73 millimeter sort of receiver diameter to it which is the same as these duct pipes so I'm gonna be able to keep the hatch closed unlock it put the duct in 
and uh, just fill the car with, with hot air. You know, so if my son is having a wait in there, you know, a little baby, or Meg wants to chill in there if it's really cold or something, or even if you break down, you know, and you, you've got to wait a long time for someone to come recover you or help you out, you've got warm air, you know, in the vehicle, you're not freezing to death. So um, that is something I plan on doing, because obviously all the heat will just, you know, kind of escape out the back of the hatch now, but you know, better than nothing. Get her fired up. Warm the engine up a bit. Well, that's me all packed up, and uh, it was a good success that was with all the gear. First time I've really run it like that with the awning room, and uh, been out camping with the vehicle without the rooftop tent. So uh, it was nice to nice to try it out actually. Obviously a lot more space, pros are as well in these conditions. I'm not clambering on top of the vehicle, setting up the tent and stuff, because um, I have like an old fashioned, well, I say old fashioned, I mean it's modern materials, but it's the old style um, clamshell fabric thing and um you know you've got like poles you need to put in and all sorts of bits and bobs and you know when it's slippery on foot and you're clambering up on the vehicle and stuff it, it does you know it doesn't get you thinking sometimes you don't want to sort of like come down hard and be on your own out in, out in the stick so probably better to either upgrade to a much better rooftop tent in the future for the family or see how the awning room goes or well, my wife's actually interested in something called the shift pod uh, which is like a, an all conditions emergency tent you know, with ducting and everything for, you know, putting in stoves and putting in the diesel heater and all sorts of stuff. So, and it's not too pricey when you compare it to kind of top end rooftop tents, like the hard top stuff. I mean, my only downside really, if I do go back to a rooftop tent is I, I pretty much lose almost all the roof rack, um, especially when you go to family size, like four man hard top in some way, like an eye camper or something. And, and also the price is insane. Um, for us anyway so you know in, in this kind of setup like this with an awning room or a ground tent uh, you know I've pretty much got the whole rack to put all the bedding and, and all the bulky stuff on and really free up space in the vehicle so it's a sort of long-term travel as a family is quite viable and, uh, and I'm leaning that way actually I'm leaning that way I won't necessarily say that we'd always be in the awning room that might just be for me when I go out solo, but um, to have an additional tent that is a bedroom that you don't have a lot of footfall in in the day, so it doesn't get dirty and stuff, and you just sleep in it at night, and then have the awning room as kind of like a day room, and then you can always then sort the ducting out for both rooms and just get a splitter so they're both getting heat and um, you know kind of run it that way. So it's food for thought, but it's great to come out and use the rig again and, and get out here and have a nice drive and have some time out in nature and just just chill really just enjoy it and see how the gear goes you've got to use it to uh to know what what it's going to do and how it's going to perform it all seems to work in your head but uh when you get out there it's just a totally different thing so yeah a bit of a liberating feeling really for me I, as i say i've been unwell for a real long time so you know it's great to be back out exploring and just being myself again but uh it's a beautiful day i'm going to take a bit of a drive back down the mountain and head on home, do my tyre pressure just before the main road and, uh, you know, go and have lunch with the family before getting on with some work. So uh, thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you again real soon. Take care.